What if everything you thought you knew about goal setting was wrong? What if the traditional guidance to dial in specific, measurable, time-bound goals was causing many of us to actually miss out on the opportunities resulting from a completely different approach? Welcome to the latest episode of the Catalyst Health, Wellness, and Performance Coaching Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Bradford Cooper of the Catalyst Coaching Institute, and today's guest is Dr. Trish Jackman. She's a lecturer in sport and exercise psychology at the University of Lincoln in the UK. Her research focuses on optimal experiences in sport, exercise, and life, and clusters around themes of flow, performance, and the key discussion today, open goals. For those of you considering pursuing certification as a health and wellness coach, you got a couple finals to keep in mind here. The final MBHWC approved certification training of this year is just weeks away. It's also your last chance to get registered before the cost goes up next year. And if you're planning to sit for the national board exam in 2022, this is the last chance to get everything in place for their required timeline. You can find out all the details at Catalyst coachinginstitute.com or as always shoot us an email results at catalyst coachinginstitute.com we'll set up some time to discuss anything that you've got along those lines now it's time to push back on traditional goal setting methodology with dr trish jackman on the latest episode of the catalyst health wellness and performance coaching podcast all right well dr jackman it is so fun to have you here thanks for joining us thanks so much it's been lovely to be invited i'm looking forward to the chat We've got a lot to cover. Your your and my research overlaps a lot. Uh, but give us some background. How did you first come to study optimal experiences, flow, performance under pressure, goal setting, all that kind of stuff? What, what, what brought you to that path? Yeah, so I guess initially my interest in optimal experience, as is often the, the case with a lot of people in the area of sport and exercise psychology, is potentially through their own experiences. Yep. Me search uh, so instead I- of research. Is that right? Yeah, so I think for me, it was definitely a curiosity and particularly in, in adolescence. So I grew up playing the, the sport of camogie, which a lot of people may have been may be familiar with the Irish sport of hurling. Um, so I played the women's version of that. And I guess there were some experiences that I had in performances that I didn't really know what they were. I didn't know what the term was to describe them, but I knew they were very unusual and they usually happen when I played really well so when I went to university I learned about some of these ideas and I just remember kind of getting a an assignment in my second year of university and it was about flow and it was almost mm-hmm. like wow I've, I've finally found what it is that I have been experiencing it was kind of almost like my eureka moment so from there I guess I, I was really interested in it um, and I guess it came to then selecting my idea for my dissertation for my undergraduate degree. And um, I, I was a bit curious about learning about this experience, but in other athletes. And I remember that summer kind of preparing my ideas for the, the following year. And I was looking at horse racing, which is obviously very big in Ireland. Um, I've ne- I'd never sat on a horse. I had no background whatsoever, but I was really curious to know what must it be like because, you know, for them as athletes, they are one or they're a very small proportion of a very large industry and very few people get to do what they do. When you look at the, the context of their sport, very few are actually there as, as the top jockeys. So um, I embarked on a, a dissertation to look at flow in, in horse racing and Interesting. In flat race jockeys. Uh, and that's pretty much where it started. And, and from there, I can continue that on into my master's and, and then into my PhD as well. And I think from there, it's kind of transitioned. So initially, obviously, I was really interested in, in almost from my own point of view. And then I discovered what well, I can actually go into research um, and I can look at this. I might be able to help other athletes. And, and then I guess in the last few years, it's also been about how can that move into more exercise mm-hmm. and just generally helping people to feel more pleasure when they're when they're exercising so, in, in regular life yeah yeah, yeah exactly okay. so that's, that's a bit of a uh, an insight into where it started and, and essentially where it's got to today so the, the way that you and I connected, and I mentioned this during the intro, is Dr. Noel Brick. We interviewed him for his book, The Genius of Athletes. And he talked about this concept of open goals that has become somewhat of a focus for you. Can you talk us through that? I, I think this is going to catch people by surprise. They're going to be thinking, wait, what, Dr. Jackman? You're, what, what am I? That's, that's not what I've heard. So can you walk us through what is that? How does it work? What are we learning about it? That kind of thing. Yeah, so... 
the idea of open goals is almost counterintuitively mm -hmm. in contrast to what is often recommended. So if we go right back to goal setting and goal setting that people are generally recommended um, in terms of practice, people are often advised to set goals that are smart. So specific, yes. measurable, sustainable, realistic and time based. And generally speaking, if we look up advice for goal setting, that's that's what we're told to do. And I guess uh, five years ago, uh, Christian Swan, who is my, my supervisor for my PhD, um, who's now leading a lot of this work on open goals, um, he did an interview study with elite golfers. And these golfers were talking about, you know, these experiences when they were performing at their best. And what he identified was that there were two different states um, that these golfers were reporting during these experiences and one of them was where they were letting it happen it was really natural effortless type of experience akin to flow so in essence that that letting it happen was like flow well, then there was this other state called making it happen where it was a bit more effortful and uh, often in pressure moments when you're you know in the case of the golfers they were coming down the stretch and they were in in you know in that top two or three looking to to win um, in the tournament and one he started to look into well how were those experiences occurring and when he started to explore these two states what he identified was when the golfers were making it happen um, or, or describing that state they were reporting these more typical specific time or in, the, in their case outcome-based goals whereas when they were letting it happen he referred to these types of goals where they were just seeing how well they could do, or they were just seeing how far um, they could, you know, move ahead in the round. But there wasn't necessarily a specific time-based or a measurable type of outcome they were looking to achieve. So in that respect, um, the idea was that these goals weren't specific. They were in the opposite of that. They were in this case not specific. And from there, this idea of open goals started to develop. So from that work, Christian has then gone on to build in, in some further qualitative studies. And in more recent years, we've been some walking studies, including um, one study by my colleague, Rebecca Hawkins. And we've been looking at this idea of open goals. Um, and open goals, they are not time-based, they're not specific, um, and they're not necessarily measurable. Um, so an open goal could be just see how well you can do. Or if I'm a runner, so I do a lot of running, I might go out and run and I'll just see how far I can run. Um, and again, it's that concept that we're not necessarily putting any type of end point on what it is we're trying to achieve. So in that respect, there is a bit more flexibility when it comes to that. I guess, you know, if we look at SMART goals and the principle of SMART goals, what we've been really interested in as well is, well, what is the evidence behind them? Because if we actually look at where smart goals <laughs> come from. No, not and, the evidence. <laughs> yeah. But if we go back to the very start, where did smart goals come from? Obviously, a lot of people assume yeah. there's lots of evidence behind them. Right. When in actual fact, it was, you know, a very brief article by a marketing consultant in the really? early 1980s. Um, and that's kind of where a lot of um, that, that idea has come from. So if we look at the evidence behind it, we know that there's work around specific goals. So if we look at someone like Desmond McEwen, he looked at uh, the use of specific versus kind of vaguer or non-specific goals in physical activity. He did a really nice meta-analysis a few years ago where he combined all the evidence that we did have. And what he found, which is obviously really interesting from an exercise perspective, is that you know, there was no significant difference between setting a specific goal and setting a vaguer, non-specific goal in the case of promoting physical activity. Both of the goals produced, you know, increases in physical activity. So that suggests that maybe this idea that smart, specific goals are best practice for everyone is not necessarily holding up as much uh, when we look at some of the evidence behind this. So, yeah, the idea of open goals, I guess, is really developed over the last five years. And I would say we're, we're still at a really early stage, but it's, it's really interesting and exciting area, I think, moving forward as well. 
And you're freaking people out right now because they're going, wait, no, we've been doing this forever. What are, you, what are you doing to me? So are there certain situations where the SMART goals have more va- or have been shown to have more value and other times where the open goals or are we still kind of feeling that out a little bit? Yeah, I think we're, we're still probably at a really early stage, but I'll, I'll give you a little bit of an insight into some of the evidence that we, we do have at present. So um, I think one of the, the, the really interesting studies was, as I said, done by my colleague, Rebecca Hawkins, and she looked at these specific goals and these open goals in both a, a group of participants who were really active and also a group who were what we would term insufficiently active. So they were active for less than 30 minutes a week. On okay. um, and they came into the lab on four occasions and they were doing six minute walk tests, which is a pretty common test for physical function in exercise. Um, but this was kind of the starting point for this. And she looked at a, a whole host of different variables, but the ones that were kind of really interested from uh, from an exercise perspective is around like enjoyment and effect. So how enjoyable was the activity and what was the degree of pleasure that people experienced? We're obviously, we're interested in how far they walked as well, but in terms of physical activity promotion, I guess why we place so much emphasis on the enjoyment and the pleasure is that if we look at a lot of the contemporary perspectives on promoting physical activity, and promoting exercise, we know that there's been a real emphasis now on pleasure because if, if we have pleasure in the activities we're doing, we're more we'll do likely it. to want them to yeah. do it again, yeah. right? So Rebecca did a study, a uh, really neat study. So she had these two groups and what she found was that in terms of the, the distance walked, um, what, what was identified there was the specific goal produced um, greater distance for the active group, but in the case of the, the insufficiently active group, they actually walk further when they were told to pursue a specific or non-specific right. goal. So in this case, the open goal. And then if we then start to build on that, we look at, okay, so what were the psychological responses? Um, so if we look at the active group, again, they found the specific goal more enjoyable than the open goal, whereas the flip was the case for the uh, insufficiently active group they found it much more enjoyable in the um, open goal instead of the, the specific goal condition. And again, if we look at pleasure during the activity, so this is a, a measure that you take um, at different intervals, so two-minute intervals during that uh, walking task, and you then look to get an average across the actual six-minute test. Again, what was found there was that the specific goal produced significantly more pleasure for the active group, whereas the open goal produced significantly more pleasure for the insufficiently active group. So in essence, that produces some really important findings. Firstly, it suggests that, you know, if we're looking to improve physical activity in those who are insufficiently active, we might need to adopt an alternative approach to what we're commonly doing right now. So a lot of people are advising to set those specific goals. Um, But if that's producing an experience that is less pleasant that might not necessarily produce the long-term increase in physical activity that we're after Um, and i think the second key point is that we need to move away from this one size fits all approach yeah yeah yeah. and when it comes to you know setting goals so we need to consider okay we have this principle of this idea of smart goals or just generally more specific goals but maybe we need to consider whether or not they're suitable for everyone and particularly for those at the, in the early stages of learning. Because even if we go back to goal setting theory, which is one of the really big theories in this field, um, if we look at what Locke and Latham said if, and then look at some of their, their work around this theory, they have suggested that actually specific goals are re, could be really useful for improving performance. But if someone is in the early stages of learning a new task, which for, for a lot of people, it could be actually getting more physically active. Setting specific goals might not necessarily be a good idea for them and it might not produce the desired effects. So again, just moving away from that one size fits right. all approach could be really beneficial. Now, again, we're at quite an early stage um, with this one. I think we're, we're looking to now build on that study and look at it, let's say, over the course of a week or a month and, and start to build up the time frame to look at how we can use these goals. 
So I guess in terms of what we've published so far, I think that's one of the really cool studies that has actually tried to look at some of the intricacies of open goals and how they might actually function differently for different people at, you know, depending on their levels of physical activity. Trish, this is so interesting. All right. So I'm jotting all this stuff down. It, it sounds like different stages of the journey. So I start off, I'm just not active and we start with the open goals. And then as I, as I move along and now it's more of a habit, I'm, I'm kind of getting my hour a day in or whatever. And now I want to run a little fast. We'll stay with the running topic. I enjoy running also. Um, I want to run a little faster. Now I might want to switch to the smart goals. Is that kind of what I'm hearing? Yeah, I think that's that's definitely, you know, uh, an idea that we, we've started to talk about quite a bit. But then equally, I think, you know, what I'm really interested in, because I'm doing some of some work and running around this at the moment. So um, I, I run a bit too myself, but myself and Noel, we've been working on, on some qualitative studies and we're looking at um, people's experiences during really rewarding running experiences. Um, and what's really interesting is that even within individual runs, you might actually set open goals at some mm-hmm. stage in the run, but then you might switch to a smart goal uh, or a specific goal at a different stage. Um, so I think you know we, we might actually use different goals on different days. So for example, um, tomorrow I'm going out for my easy run. So I won't be too concerned about my pacing. And right. um, so I'm not going to be can really focus on that. But if I know if I have to go for an interval session, I'm probably going to be looking at to dial in those paces. So I think, yeah, I think that's a really interesting idea around over time. How can we progress to um, helping people, supporting people to use those more specific goals as and when they may need them? But equally, are there some benefits at other stages to us then maybe using those more non-specific goals at times as well? I love the way you brought in the day-to-day stuff because... Uh, yeah, same thing. If I'm doing a tempo run, I want to be at six ten pace for ten miles. Blah, 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 blah. But if I'm going out for a trail run, I'm just I'm just out for a run. I don't even care. Yeah. So and, and so that's it's good to point that out. Now, uh, some people that are listening, I know they're going, "Oh my gosh, this is so wishy washy. This is so soft." Like they're the intense folks. They're the what? Like that doesn't help. You're just going to do what you can. Well, then you're going to be a slacker. And what what would you say to that person that's looking at you cross-eyed and saying, Trish, yeah, that's kind of the slacker method. What, what, what do you say to that person? Yeah. I, I think, you know, from a performance perspective, I think there's, you know, if we look at a lot of the work in this area and even just drawing some of our own evidence, I think, you know, those specific goals are going to be really important for to, you to, to take to, it up a notch. Exactly. Okay. But, but then equally at times, you know, if it's a recovery run um, that you're trying to get in, it could be you know useful to set an open goal or equally, you know, think about if you're doing something that's really new. So let's say you're stepping up in distance for the first time. Um, you might not necessarily mm. want to put pressure on yourself because that's one of the things that we know when it comes to those specific goals is that often people, get really concerned with the outcome because well what will happen if I don't achieve that outcome you know so all of a sudden you're almost creating a scenario where you may start to perceive some more pressure as a result of that so you know what we what we tend to find is that when people are going into a new situation the novelty there but also that maybe they can afford to be a little bit flexible with those goals um that these more non-specific open goals could be quite useful. So I think it depends on depends on your focus. Um, and if you're really performance oriented, those specific goals can be really useful and good for your performance. But then equally, it's about marrying that up with okay, what strategies are going to help you. So when you get into that, you know, really high intensity workload, what strategies are you going to combine with that? Are you going to add in some self-talk to kind of keep you going when it starts to get a little bit tougher, for example? Um, because, you know, those distraction strategies are probably not going to help you too much when you're coming down the stretch and your body is probably telling you that it's, you know, not really enjoying what it's doing. So I guess it's being aware that when we're looking at those specific goals, um, it's about then having the tools in your mental toolkit almost to be able to adapt to what you need to adapt to in those stages. I I love this. And and the way you 
presented it as when you're starting something, even if you're the high performer, as you step into that new, you know, I'm going to do Prefontaine's old 20 by 400 session. And I've never done it before. Instead of saying, I've got to hit 72s on that. Let's just see what we can do. It's the first one. Now, eventually we'll set some smart goals, but initially, and you didn't use these words, but I'm guessing you're thinking about it. The whole challenge threat research of mm. if I say I've got to hit 72s and on the 12th interval, I hit a 75 and I don't feel like I'm going to go any fast. Now we sudden we kick in the threat methodology instead of the challenge and we start going downhill. Is that, am I on the right path in, in terms of what's going on behind the scenes? Yeah, I think, I think that's a really good way of, of framing it. So we've kind of thought a lot about that in terms of, you know, what's really key to having these more pl- rewarding experiences, whether that be kind of this more effortless type flow state or a more intense um, type experience, which you refer to as, as a clutch state. Um, what's really key to the two of those is that you do feel confident. So obviously that's going to be key to your challenge appraisal. Um, and one of the things, again, if we start to, to think about performance, what would often get us a little bit concerned is if, if we're not hitting yeah. those performance yeah. benchmarks. Um, so like you said there, I think that's a really good example. When we're going into the first time where it might be in a really big session, we've never done anything like that before. Um, you know, we don't want to have any additional anxiety going in there of thinking, A, I haven't done this before. And then be okay. So I need to hit this level of performance the whole way through that session, for example. Um, So I think that's a really, really good way of looking at how we could build it in over time. So then you might change the focus in your next session because you almost have you have that reference point now, right? um, Whereas you didn't have it in the first occasion. I love this. When I first was reading your research and looking, I thought, boy, I don't know, but this is. I love this. So let's, I, I want to get into your other stuff, the flow, the performance under pressure, that kind of thing. But one more question on this open uh, versus smart goals. How would someone like a coach, an educator, a parent, I see a lot of opportunity here for parents, use these strategies when they're coming along other people. We've talked around a lot of these things, any kind of final thoughts, and I'm sure we'll circle back to it, but before we move into your other focus areas, any other suggestions for that parent, that coach, that educator to kind of tie this stuff together? Yeah, I guess it's it's probably the key thing is to, to recognize that maybe at different stages or, or different times, even in a season, that these different goals might be more relevant. So if there's a more of a performance focus uh, at a specific stage mm-hmm. in the year, you may be more aligned to those more specific goals. Um, but then at, at different stages, it could be about setting those more open goals. So again, as we said there, maybe in those situations, novelty or where we don't want to place too much expectation on people. And I think that's you know one of the key things about the open goal is that it doesn't necessarily create that barometer performance that we need to hit. Um, so again, it's probably seeing what, what works for the athlete um, is really important or for the exerciser. Um, and how might we try to, to combine those? So, yeah, I think, you know, if, if someone's new to an activity, maybe a, more of a non-specific goal could be really useful. And then over time, you might build into those more specific goals. But, yeah, I think we're, we're probably at an early stage as regards the, the applied angle. Um, but I think they would be some of my suggestions at, at the minute for sure. Okay. Uh, and I said that was my last one on that topic, but I lied here. One more, as you <laughs> talked about that, I, I'm thinking about the outside. So the, the, when it's you and you're running or me and I'm, I know, okay, it's baseline. It'd be best for me to, to go with the open goal today because such and such, and then I'll move in because I've got this huge intrinsic motivation. What about the coach, the parent, the, the educator who's working with somebody that maybe that student, that athlete, that child doesn't have a lot of intrinsic motivation at what point and, and i know you haven't researched this yet so just mm-hmm. hypothetically at what point would you suggest shifting from open oh son just do the best you can for five years versus now it's time for a smart goal is, is there any hints as to when an outsider you and i know for ourselves but this is an outsider a coach an educator a parent an outsider can come alongside and say okay now You've done the open. Now it's time to let's do some little shifting into the smart goals. 
Yeah, uh, I, I don't know when the time point will be, but I think in terms of advice around that, I think what's really important is that we we want to make sure that it's uh, an autonomous decision on the part of the athlete as well. Um, so, you know, that we are retaining that that athlete-centered, person-centered perspective with it. So, yeah, I think maybe, you know, speaking to the athlete and working through what their motives are, you know, what is their reason, what do they value? Um, and then try to align those goals with that as well. I think that, that's really important because, again, if we look at some of the work around motives and goal motives, we know that if, if those specific goals can be more autonomous, so we've actually chosen to, to do them, the likelihood is that they are going to have more positive impact yeah. for yeah. us. So I think, yeah, definitely that um, you know, working in, in collaboration with, with the athlete and you know, trying to tap into their motives, I think would be a really good start. Okay, good, good advice. All right, let's 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 spend a couple minutes on each of these flow, performance under pressure, and optimal experience. Uh, obviously, these overlap. There's a lot of combination in them, but can you share some of the highlights that you've discovered that might be a surprise to our listener, listeners related to each one of these? So let's start with flow. People probably know that term. She sent me high. They maybe even read some of his research, but... Can you give us maybe a couple of surprising things you've discovered when it comes to flow and how that all plays out in our lives? Yeah, so um, I guess over the last five years or so, um, we've been looking into this in in a number of different sports, particularly uh, using qualitative methods. So typically we'll we'll interview people. Um, And we've been using a method called uh, event-focused interviewing. So we try to interview people pretty soon after an activity. Um, So if we look at a lot of the really good work, um, some of the early work in particular, and even some of my own initial studies, we used interviews where, you know, we get people to talk about their experiences over the whole of their career, for example. Um, Whereas this method we've been using over the last few years, we're actually trying to interview people within hours or a few days of the activity. So on average, kind of two, four days, whatever it may be. and I guess, you know, if we look at the history of flow and work started in 1975, some of the, the early sport work in the 1990s, some really great work by Susan Jackson. And I suppose over the years, it's really started to develop and to grow. And um, But in the, I guess, in the last five years, we've started to look it through using this, this alternative method, but equally um, trying to really look at the athlete experience and the exerciser perspective on this because um, I guess initially the Chicks and the High work was there. It was focused on the nine dimensions, which, you know, been adopted really widely. So again, if we look at the where flow has been researched, it's pretty much been researched in you know, every type of activity you can yeah. think of. And um, I, I guess from there, there has been this assumption that when an athlete is at their best, they are in flow. Uh, and that's kind of been a, a common thing that there is one optimal psychological state. Right. Um, right. And I think that's kind of an assumption that a lot of people have had for many years. Again, if we even look, um, you know, at some really uh, big sporting movements over the last few years, often you will hear the commentator referring to, you know, they're, they're getting into flow in, in those situations. But I, I guess to that, that golf work that I referred to earlier, um, Christian's work, started to explore this idea of of two psychological states. So these golfers, they delivered excellent performances and and Christian interviewed them soon after. And they started to differentiate between flow when they were letting it happen, really natural, automatic, effortless, that type of state that, you know, a lot of people know about. But then also they were talking about making it happen. Now, in subsequent work, we've gone on to refer to this as a clutch state, which I'm sure we're probably going to get onto a little bit more in a while as well. But in terms of flow, I guess that that idea, I, I guess one kind of difference in, in some of our work is suggesting that it's not just flow when an athlete is performing at their best, um, that there may be an alternative state that people can also get into, and particularly when they're in a pressure situation game is on the line and that sort of thing so yeah i think that's probably one of the the main um, areas that we've identified through some of this work in the last number of years okay good um do you want to touch on the clutch state now you want to pull that into the performance under pressure your your call on this one 
I, I think we should keep going. So in terms of this clutch state, um, this, this experience was much more effortful. Um, it was a state in which there was a really deliberate and complete focus. So if we think about flow, one of the hallmark characteristics is this idea that we're really focused on what we're doing, but it doesn't seem to take as much mental effort mm. for us to actually concentrate our focus. Whereas in the clutch state, it was much more this sense of, I am really focusing in on something here. It's, you know, whether it's I need to execute a pass, I need to catch a ball, whatever it may be. Um, so it was a much more intense state in that regard, but also physically, people were saying that they were exerting a lot more effort. Now, if we look at it from a performance perspective, what we tend to find is that people, when they refer to both of these states, for example, in the same performance at different stages, we tend to see flow happens early on okay. when you know they aren't necessarily as concerned with the outcome of the performance. So maybe they are kind of going out there, seeing how that first half goes, let's say, for a football player. But then in the second half, we're thinking about the end result. We're thinking about what we need to do if we want to be ahead on that scoreboard when the clock ticks down. And that's when the athletes tend to report these, this clutch state. Um, now, these two states share some similarities. So we are really feel really confident during both of these states. Uh, we also really absorbed in what we're doing. Um, so we have that, that real focus. But those differences are around the concentration. It's much, there's a much greater um, uh, perception of effort in terms of our, our mental focus. Also our physical effort would perceive that as being a lot more intense, which again, if we think about a runner in a race, um, early on, we're probably gonna be a little bit more conservative, but we're also really fresh. We're feeling really good early on. But as we start to unwind our effort and we're starting to you know, push towards the end, we're going to up it and, and we might start to move into maybe more that that clutch day. Um, and another key characteristic was around the levels of arousal. So it's, flow tends to be a much more relaxed type of experience, whereas clutch was much more intense and tended to happen in, you know, real discrete phases. So again, if we're a runner, when that last mile, we're pushing for a PB, um, we really try to up our effort. And that's one of the, the, the key points around clutch is when the athletes were reporting this state, they actually also reported a real distinct concerted effort to up what they were doing, to really try to push on, to exert, and to really get as much out of themselves as they could in those closing stages. And again, one of the key elements behind that state, that clutch state, was the specific goal because they had something specific in mind that they were going after and they really focused in, honed in on trying to achieve that in that period. So right when we started today, you started, you were talking about the golf study and you said there was this distinction between letting it happen, making it happen. Is the clutch state the making it happen or is the making it happen the negative side when you go too far and you start freezing up? I think that I think that's a really good from a from a theoretical perspective, but equally just from how we discuss it, I think that's a really good contrast. So there's probably a very, you know, subtle yeah, line, yeah, yeah. a really distinct line in terms of just going over it and it's too much versus just doing enough. And I think that's that's something that I think is is quite exciting to look at. We we may have heard of the idea of choking before. Yeah. Um, and you know, is there kind of is clutch um, stepping up your performance under pressure, for example, is that something that's um, in some ways the opposite of, of choking? I think that that's an interesting idea to explore in the future. Um, so a lot of your listeners, you may have heard of this idea of clutch performance before. Yeah. Um, so that's a term that we regularly see. You know, in the media, they, they often use that you know, they, they shot a winner right. in a clutch, whatever it may be. Um, so this idea behind the clutch state is that that is the psychological experience that often occurs in when an athlete delivers a clutch performance. Um, and Matthew Schweigel, he's a, a PhD researcher at University of Wollongong. So he's published a review last year on, on clutch performance and what we know around that area. So I think there'll be some really interesting work to come out of that in the future as regards clutch performance, clutch state. Do they need to occur to, uh, simultaneously and so on? So I think that's a really interesting year. But as you said, I think it's probably a really fine line between 
trying to push too hard and just trying to push so that you actually deliver that top performance in the most crucial moments. So again, just asking you to hypothesize here because it's you're talking about it's being done, but are there tips, practical suggestions you can give us for that person who says, oh yeah, I recognize that. Like I, I, I see the flow when I'm kind of letting it happen. I see when I'm in that clutch and I'm just like, I'm nailing it. I'm going all in. I'm super focused. And I also notice when I take that too far, are there some tips on how to not cross that sliver that we're talking about here? Yeah. So I think it's a really interesting one because I think some of the the qualitative work that we're, we're analyzing at the moment is probably tapping into some of those ideas. And again, if I, I talk about some of the runners in particular, and they often talk about it as almost like the red line. Yes. And you want to push it to that red line, but you want to make sure that you don't go over it. Or if you do, you manage to get back down again in time before it has a detrimental impact. So I think what's what's really important, and again, it will differ depending on the activity, um, is around some of the strategies that you do use in those moments. Um, to be aware that if you're exerting a big effort, you need to be monitoring your bodily sensations for that. For example, if you are a runner, because you want to make sure that you're going to be able to manage that effort to be able to optimize it. A, obviously, you don't want to, to get to a stage at the end where you think I could have exerted a bit more. But then equally, you don't want to get to a situation where, you know, you are at the equivalent of bonking before you get to the end. So. <laughs> Being able to develop those skills around knowing your body, for example, um, in the case of a runner, knowing your body, being able to monitor those internal sensations um, and then be able to make some judgments around, OK, do I need to use a, a different strategy at this point? Um, so, for example, if you do, let's say, external monitoring as well, we might do that. So I'm a runner. I'm going to look at my watch. I see my pace is a little bit too quick. So I'm thinking, okay, higher order thinking, I'm thinking, all right, that pace is too quick. That's going to have a, a detrimental impact down the line. I need to change my strategy. So then I then look at self-regulation. Um, so I'm trying to think about, okay, change my pace here. I need to, to bring that pace back a stretch. And that's obviously going to help me in the long run. So I think, again, it's probably going to differ depending on that activity. Um, I'm, I'm thinking also about my own experiences in team sport, the team sport that I would play in. And obviously when you're in pressure situations, a lot of the time it's actually just being able to regulate your emotions. Um, so obviously you're in those situations, they're going to be ups and downs. It's probably just about keeping it nice and level in those scenarios. So I think there's a really good saying around when the highs are too high, don't allow the highs to be too high or the lows to be too low. So just be able to manage that. Um, so when we talk about clutch, um, you know, some three really good things will be firstly around confidence. So just make sure you maintain that confidence at the right level for you. Uh, around challenge, so again, we've spoken about challenge and threat, so maintaining that, that challenge appraisal in those scenarios. And then thirdly, around control. So again, maintaining control, focusing on what, what it is we can control in that moment. So whether that be, you know, whatever processes we're enacting in our performance, I'm a golfer, I might focus on my routine, whatever that may be. So those kind of three C elements could be really um, nice focuses for people when they are in those pressure moments and they're looking to maximize their performance. Okay, good, good. So so in a lot of ways, you, you mentioned watching their pace, not just recognizing what the body's doing, but becoming familiar with what our head's doing, what our self-talk's doing, what our uh, positive, negative up and down it is doing in that. So we recognize it later when we're in that next high pressure situation. Uh, yeah, I think that's really good. And I think also that builds into that period of reflection. Right, 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 because right. Because after that performance, yeah, we want to look back and think, okay, did that strategy work at that time? Yes. Um, if not, is there something I need to change to? Um, so Noel Brick has done a lot of work around this and, and he talks about this idea of reflection how we then use that to go in and plan for our next performance. So we're almost trying to close the loop in yeah. some respects, but bring that forward yeah. into our next performance. So again, if we think about a lot of runners, again, I'm just going to use this example. 
But if you're trying to, to run a longer distance, maybe you're planning for something like an ultra, you're going to try out your fueling strategy in advance. You're going to reflect on that and you're going to bring it forward mm -hmm. into the planning for the next event. So I think it's, it's very, very similar. And again, that encouraging that reflection and that introspection. One thing I do find with a lot of runners, when I, when I talk to them um, about these specific races or runs that they've had, is that I, I ask them when I turn off the recorder, what, what was it like? Ne and they'll always say, I've never thought about my performance or how I run in that much totally. detail because we get them to just recall it chronologically. And they're often astounded at, at you know, some of the, the finer nuances of their thinking, yeah. but they've never in tune into it. time or never even thought about yeah. actually how can I use that to build into the future as well. Yeah. Um, so I think, yeah, the, by reflecting on that, it then becomes a learning process. So we can actually learn from that strategy use to see what was effective, what wasn't so effective, and how might we use that experience to feed forward into the future as well. Yeah, yeah, that's good. All right, you, we've talked about a lot of optimal experience things already. Anything else you want to throw into that bucket, if you will, before we jump into the next one? Yeah, I think um, for me, I guess the, the big thing is that to identify, you know, which of those states you might want to get into at different points in a performance and just to know some of the outcomes. So, again, thinking about that clutch state, it's going to be effortful. It's going to be, you know, potentially have feelings of difficulty in there. So, again, just managing that, I think, is, is really key. So, like it is, you don't want to go out and storm it really early in the race and, and just get to a stage where you're not going to have energy later on. Yeah. Um, so it's about managing that effort, for example. Um, and, but then equally, if we look at these, these states, what we tend to see is, again, the goals might be really valuable here. Um, so if we're thinking about those that, that flow type state, we may be looking at those more flexible, non-specific goals. But then equally, if we want to focus on the performance, again, as we progress on, and we're thinking about a certain time, those more specific goals could be really helpful. And again, it's just looking at how we might use those in performance and also in training, but equally just the more recreational run when you're going out there for a run and how we might build that in. I'd be curious to see, you know, what people find when they do try this out, because again, it, it's going to be quite individual um, as well to people. So yeah, I'd be keen to see what, what people um, try out and, and what may work for that. Nice. Love it. All right. So let's take a left turn a little bit here. You're studying stress in doctoral students. I found that interesting. Any initial, I know that's just getting started, any initial findings that might be beneficial to folks that are not necessarily doctoral students, but entering other stressful situations in life or settings or, or pursuits, that kind of thing? Yeah. And I, and I think it's, you know, it's, it's the type of, um, you know, work that, that can link into to different different employment areas you know I've done a lot of work in policing as well um you know so we've been looking at kind of stress and well-being in police and now looking at in doctoral students so yeah over the last kind of three or four years there's been another strand to my work and I, I guess if we look a lot of the statistics around doctoral students we know that there there are some concerns around psychological well-being and mental health in this group so We've definitely been trying to, to do some work around trying to help this scenario. Um, so over the last couple of years in particular, I've been looking at, at, at early stages. So looking at even the induction process and those early stages, that transition, because we know, for example, that you know, certainly in the UK, um, in terms of context, someone does a, a doctoral research uh, study um, they're pretty much going to be in isolation for a lot of that. So even though there will be other people like them doing other projects, they are focused on their project. That is their, their project for three to four years. And the really demanding um, type of study because a lot of the time there won't be a taught component. There's not necessarily that structure that we're often so used exactly. to in an undergraduate or a master's level. Right. And, um, so, you know, we speak to a lot of the, some, some researchers will actually say, I was in those first few weeks, and I wasn't really sure, should I be doing this? And if I am doing something, is that the right thing? There is that kind of uncertainty. We're not really that sure. Um, so we've been doing some work around this. And yeah, there's, there's definitely some ideas that I think I can share. 
um, that that we're seeing quite a bit of. And we're going to be hopefully sharing this a lot more widely over the next few weeks and months as well. Um, but I think, you know, in particular, what's really important is support from supervisors is really paramount. And again, this can apply to, to work any workplace setting as well, is around supporting that that new employee, for example, into that transition. Um, how do we support them? Are we having that kind of maybe that meeting at the start to clarify expectations and so on that is really going to obviously firm up some of the um, how we're going to operate moving forward. Um, so that supervisor relationship is really, really key because again, you know, again, if we look at sport, we talk about the coach athlete relationship. So from the context of a doctoral student um, or a doctoral researcher, what's really important is that supervisor researcher relationship. Um, another key thing is around peers. So we've been, you know, really, um, you know, we've heard a lot around the importance of actually connecting with people like me. So for example, mm -hmm. as in, I'm a doctoral researcher, I feel I'm having these challenges, and then I go and talk to other people, and you know what? <laughs> They're saying the same thing. So maybe it's not just me. I, I maybe totally. there are actually other people who are experiencing some of these I, uh, these challenges and I think that's one of the, the difficulties that we don't even have a natural cohort we're sitting beside every day right and we're able to speak to and we're actually in the same room for example encountering the same difficulties with understanding a piece of text or whatever it may be um so peer connections is really really important so for example if, if we're working with students how do we prepare them before they arrive can we create links for those new doctoral researchers? So could we, for example, set, uh, uh, allow them to, or get them to email one of the current students to find out, for example, about simple things or what we consider simple, but, you know, accommodation, where, where should I stay? Where would you recommend? Or what are the social activities like? Um, and then equally when, when people get on campus is how can we, how can we facilitate those connections to develop? How can we get them to, to, to interact in a way that is going to potentially help them academically, but equally is going to give them that social outlet and those people that they can talk to when maybe they are having some difficulties. And then I think the third key area um, that, that has certainly come through is around, you know, just some of the student services support. And when it comes to well-being provision or student services provision, a lot of the focus quite naturally and understandably because of the, the size of the cohorts or, or uh, when it comes to undergraduate students, it does tend to be focused on undergraduate students. Um, so a lot of doctoral researchers are, on, are less certain on what might be the offering that is there to help me. And I think from that perspective, it's just you know, being really clear, maybe having a dedicated area on the website around you know, doctoral students, maybe activities that they can access. And again, it's you know, what some of the, the participants are talking about is just trying to make it really practically oriented. So, you know, we've heard people talk about, you know, well-being for writing or time management. And, and again, these are really practical aids that are going to help people to manage the challenges um, that bit better. And, and another key thing, I think, linked to that, certainly that we found through the review that we did recently was so many of the, the participants talk about the importance of just taking time for yourself, mm. to engaging in that in that self care, to avoid a circumstance where we are overworking. Okay, so again, if we look at academia, there is that tendency towards very long working hours and, and that culture that is there at present. Um, and if we can try to shift the dial a little bit with that and ensure that we are taking a break, and recognize that those breaks are actually really important. Um, they're going to help to restore us. And ultimately, going to have a, a better impact in the long run for our studies. That's all really valuable insight. And I'm thinking it's we're phrasing it in terms of the, the PhD student. But as you're talking about, I'm thinking that applies to employers, that applies to teachers, that applies to coaches. I mean, the, the application is wonderful across that board. And I'll just give a shout out. You mentioned the supervisor impact as you were coming into this, I was thinking, what had the biggest impact for me when I was going through my PhD? No question, Dr. Martin Jones, Dr. Mark Wilson, they had to talk me off the ledge multiple times. And I'm, I was a 50 year old going through this thing. So I knew how to do the time management. I knew how to monitor the stuff, make sure, but still 
Had it not been for them, I don't know. I, I just don't know. Mm-hmm. I mean, they got it. They connected. They understood what I needed. They knew. So yes, for the supervisors out there, the impact you can have. And again, I'm talking to, to Trish from the PhD side, but managers, parents, coaches, et, et cetera. It's, uh, it's so, mm-hmm. so, so important. All right. One more. I, I, I want to, before we do the last question, how can folks follow you? You're on Twitter, uh, website. What, what would you like folks that are thinking, wow, this is so interesting and I want to stay up to date on what she's doing. How do they find you? How do they follow you? Yeah, absolutely. So you follow me on Twitter. I'm at Trish underscore Jackman. So you'll find me there. Uh, and also you can just drop me an email. So I'm pjackman at lincoln.ac.uk. So yeah, more than happy to, to feel emails, get in touch with me on Twitter. And um, I try to share research, get it out there as much as I possibly can via uh, social media. And hopefully you know, in, in the coming weeks, we'll have some more work up there that we can share. But anyone who wants to get in touch with me, please do so. Yeah, and you're great. You, I think you responded to me an hour after I sent you the email about this when we talked to Noel. So last question, uh, non-running how are you applying your findings in your life, whether it's with your studies, your work, your relationships, your personal health and wellness? What, what are you doing in the non-running? Because we've talked a lot of running and people are going, Brad, stop talking about running. But what else, uh, how else are you applying this for you personally? Mm. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because I think, um, so before the pandemic started, I was playing still pretty, pretty good level, top level Camogie in Ireland. Uh, which meant traveling over and back quite a lot. So I think, you know, over the last kind of 16 months, I've learned quite a bit around, um, it's been very, very different, let's just say. But in terms of what I implement, you know, I think for me, I place a, a great importance on getting outside, getting into nature. That's that's really important for me. So generally, I try to start the morning before I, I get start my work is I'm, I'm getting outside mm. usually for a run. Um, but then in the evenings, I also try to, to almost bookend my day and, and I don't do any work after that point. So I get out in the evenings um, and try to, you know, take that that break, take that rest. I know that in the evenings, I'm not going to function anyway. Uh, that, that tends to be a thing. But yeah, I think I've, I'm probably not always the best at it. Um, but I'm definitely learning to get better at it and know what the signs are that maybe I'm, I'm tired and that I am in, in need of a break. So, yeah, I think for me, nature is, is really, really important to get out um, into to the, you know, out into green areas, to blue spaces and, and just to take in that environment as well and to just appreciate it, I think, as well when, when you do have the opportunity to do it. Yeah, beautiful. Dr. Jackman, such a privilege. Thank you so much for joining us. This is great. Thank you so much and uh, hope everyone enjoys it. For those of you who heard our interview with best-selling author and researcher Noel Brick, you now understand why he spoke so highly of Dr. Jackman in her research. Thank you for tuning into the number one podcast for health and wellness coaching. We love hearing from our listeners. Email is results at catalystcoachinginstitute.com and there are plenty of additional resources for you over at catalystcoachinginstitute.com. Next week's guest is Professor Moyes Jaiwa. He's with Health Design, and the story of how we got connected is one you'll appreciate, but his insights about the direction of health and wellness around the world will definitely give you a spark. Now it's time to be a catalyst on this journey of life, the chance to make a positive difference in the world while simultaneously improving our own lives, the essence of being a catalyst. This is Dr. Bradford Cooper of the Catalyst Coaching Institute. Make it a great rest of your week, and I'll speak with you soon on the next episode of the Catalyst Health, Wellness, and Performance Coaching Podcast or maybe over on the YouTube coaching channel.